and we'll get started for today. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about relational data. Let me show you a picture of what that looks like and explain what that is and why we're doing it. Um, which picture do I want to show? I'll show this one. So in data systems, and this is outside of R as well, oftentimes you have your data stored not just in one table. Um, you picked up on this with the Lord of the Rings data set last week. Sometimes you have multiple tables that contain different information that relate to each other. So in our case, um, we're going to be talking today about a basically a set of tables that are about baseball statistics that relate to each other in some way. Um, I'm using this as an example to start explaining it to you so that we can we can pick up on what, what I'm trying to teach. Um, so in our baseball database, we have different tables that store different types of information. For instance, we have one um, database, which is actually called people. And it's literally just the birth dates, the death dates, the, um, I don't know, favorite color of baseball players. And so we've got this table, which we're gonna look at in a few minutes, which is just a table of people. Each row is a person and there is different columns for different attributes to those people. However, we don't have any baseball statistics about those people because those are in the other tables. So for instance, in the batting table, let's say Semyon is a baseball player. We have more than one row for every season that Semyon, play, Semyon played baseball. So we have a row for Semyon playing baseball at American University and what his batting average was and all this information. And then we have a row of Semyon playing baseball at, I don't know, the Red Sox um, and all of the batting statistics from there. And then those are in different years. And then Raphael has his own row too because he played at American University and then the White Sox. And we've got different information there for batting. But then we have the same sorts of questions but instead of batting, because maybe some people only are pitchers, we've got pitching information. And all of these different tables are connected to this people table through something called a player ID. So maybe Rafael's player ID is Rafael Saavedra 1. And then in the pitching table, it's consistent. Every time we're talking about Rafael, we're talking about those numbers. And we can link that back to the people table through that player ID. Um, then we've got the teams table, which is information about the team, what league they're in, what their full name is, not just what their ID is, but what their full name is, um, overall like wins and losses statistics. And those are also linked to these other tables. So you can kind of see we've got player ID, player ID, but then we've also got year ID, which is linked to the teams team ID, which is linked to teams, and league, that's what LG stands for, ID, which is linked to the teams. With play, with your ID, we're not linking to people because the things in the people table don't change, like their birth date. So this is what we're going to be working with today. For a lot of you, I think this is kind of new information on how to link tables. If you've ever taken a class on database systems, this is majorly review, but if you haven't, this is gonna be a lot of new information on how do we link tables together? Because some of you, when you're building, working on your final projects, you might be wanting to um, connect different tables together. And in our case, we weren't gonna be working strictly in a database itself. We're just gonna be working with a lot of different tables that we need to connect together. But I'm gonna say this now because I probably forget by the end of class. At the very end of this lesson, there's an appendix and it's on how to work with databases themselves in dplyr. So, or in R. Um, the benefit of a database instead of just a table is a table, you're storing that all in your current memory on your computer. So your computer has to like think through it all. It has to use all of that in its current working memory. A database means it's not currently there. It's like held somewhere else and you're connecting to it and it's a lot faster. So if you have very large data, that's where you'd want to use a database. It's also there because most of you, if you end up in some sort of data job, you will be working with databases. They're very heavily used in business. So I want to give you the information, but I don't want to teach it necessarily because we don't have the time for it. So I'm saying this now and I'll say it at the end of the class that it's here. So you're able to look back on it later and you can go through it on your own time. Okay. 
So we have these tables and now we need to figure out how the heck we're going to work with them. Um, right now, you can think of other things we've learned. We've learned pivots. That's not going to help us because these are two separate tables. We've learned mutate, summarize. These are still separate tables in R and so we can't work with them yet. And so we have to figure out a way if I want to connect, let's say I want to see if the batting average changes if you're older or you're younger. Well, I, at that place, I don't have their birth dates, so I can't calculate that. I'm going to need to join these two tables together in order to calculate that. So that's what we'll be learning today. So I will pull up R now and we can get started. So these tables are connected through things like people ID, like I mentioned, and people ID would be a primary key for the people table. So let's pull up the people table. In order to do that, we need to pull up our data. So let me make a new cell and we're gonna library tidyverse and we will library. And here's one that most people have to download. It's called L with a capital L, A-H-M-A-N. So I'll go ahead and say install packages Lamen. So this is named after a person in the 1990s who decided that baseball statistics shouldn't be proprietary, that they should be open source and everyone should be able to access them with the surname Lamen. And he still maintains it. And there's an R package of his database that he created in like 1992, a really long time ago. And he still maintains it to this day. So this, this data is up, I think it starts in 1890 something up until 2019 of baseball statistics. So I have five tables. There's more than that in this package, but we have five tables we're gonna be working with today. We have people, we have teams, we have fielding, we have pitching, and we have batting. So these are five kind of main um, sources of information that we'll want to look at. And I know these are saved as data frames, not tibbles, and I found that very annoying when I was developing this lesson, so I'm going to go ahead and switch those right away. So I'm going to say as tibble from the Laman package, the people data frame. And then the same thing for all of these, as tibble, Lawman, and this will also let you guys all catch up while you're downloading the package. Um, fielding. I'm getting bored of typing this already. I'm sure you all will as well, but you're welcome to copy and paste. <laughs> Pitching. And the final one we have is as Tibble, Lawman, and Batting. So you'll see here there's batting posts, there's batting labels, there's a lot of different information here. But as I said, we're going to focus specifically on these five tables. So I'm just going to run these so that they will become part of our um, working session, we'll be able to see them up here. And you can see, you know, bad, and we've got 107,000 rows. Hopefully that's enough for all of your computers to not crash on us, but um, let me know if it does, because we'll just modify the activity for a computer that is terrible with it, working memory. So as I said, let's actually take a look at this people data frame and talk about what the heck a primary key is. So a primary key, and I'm gonna write this here, primary key is respective to each individual table. So the primary key is respective to each table and uniquely identifies observations in a table. So in our case, I already know that this player ID, which you can see is getting cut off. That's why we have a tilde here it uniquely identifies these rows. So we can double check if something's uniquely identified um, by doing something like people count player ID and then filtering if N, which we get from the count is greater than one. So if anything is repeated, that means it's not uniquely identified. So we're seeing how many rows 
are there which, with each of these player IDs. And if it comes up as zero, we want that. We want to know that that's uniquely identifying the um, people rows. And this is important because this is the primary key. However, if I want to talk to the people's primary key from a different table, that's called a foreign key. Um, foreign key from, let's see, let me see how I can write this concisely. Uh, people player ID, I'll write it with the dollar sign, is the foreign key from the perspective of batting, let's just say. So if we look at the batting table, so I should probably zoom in. There. Now it's nice and big for you all. <laughs> so if I look at the head batting, that is probably. So if I look at the batting statistics, you can see we've got player ID here. We've got year ID, we've got team ID, league ID, and then a bunch of actual statistics. If you want to know what these statistics are, you can do question mark batting. No, that's not going to work. It would be, have to be question mark lawman batting. And that's because that's where the original data is coming from. And we can read what each of these variables stands for. So we have a little code book here. So for instance, G is how many games they played in, at bats, runs. I don't know. I don't really know too much about baseball. But we can see player ID is here. However, if we want to look at if player ID uniquely identifies rows in the batting table, I can tell you already, it doesn't. And that's because these players played more than one, um, played on more than one team in more than one season generally. So we have about 15,000 baseball players, which have more than one row in the batting data frame. So we know that in batting, player ID is not a primary key. However, we can use the primary key of player ID from people and connect it to batting. We don't really care whether you're calling it primary key or foreign key. The only time that this is important is when you're working specifically with databases, you need to know the difference. And just to have the, the language kind of us all be on the same page with the language that we're using. If you took a class on databases, I'm sure you'd have an entire exam on what's a, um, a foreign key and a primary key. This is just to get you thinking, OK, primary key is of the table itself, what uniquely identifies it. And sometimes that's more than one column combined together. And then um, in the batting data frame here, it doesn't. Let me see. I don't think it has its own primary key. So technically, its primary key here would be the row number, which like would be useful, not useful if we wanted to connect to it in any way. But the it basically has foreign keys to other tables. Okay. So let me just show you the image one more time, so you can see the primary keys are just underlined. So these are all primary keys and the ones with a tilde in front of them represent a foreign key. So there's no primary key in batting, fielding or pitching. We're just connecting to these other um, tables. So we can look through all of these different tables. Um, we might as well look through teams just to have a look at what it looks like. Teams with a capital T. Let's scroll up a little bit. So here, the primary key is actually a combination of three different columns. And so I'm never sure if that means we have three primary keys or if our, we have one primary key spread among a few columns. Um, but we have our year ID, our league ID, and our team ID. Those are the three that uniquely identify each row. So BS1, whatever team that is, is going to be repeated for another year. This is like our F Afghanistan 1952 versus our Afghanistan 1977 idea where each of them are a unique row because technically those are each unique observations. Okay. 
Uh, Kelsey, just a yes. quick, quick question. Um, I just want to make sure I have this right. So are you saying that the primary key is the kind of ID in the main, in the master data frame? And then the foreign key is the the IDs of like the the primary key ID, but in the far in the uh, secondary tables. Yes, but sometimes you have more than one kind of like master tables. In this case, it's called master here. It's actually called people. This is an old graphic. Right. Um, so the people data frame has its primary key, but then the teams data frame also has its primary keys. So when we say primary key it's respective to whatever kind of main table that we're focusing on like you said kind of like the primary table i guess that's primary key primary table and then the secondary tables when they speak to the other table it's called a foreign key and this can get like this is a very simple representation of what this could look like this can be extremely complicated and you'll have multiple foreign keys um you can imagine a database of elementary school information where you've got different classes, you've got information on teachers, information on students, and then you have information on who's in what class, when, what the attendance looks like per student. Like it can get really complicated with a bunch of tables talking to each other. And the primary key in one table is always gonna be a foreign key from another table. So um, maybe we have information on classrooms. And so in the classroom information, the teacher ID would be a foreign key talking to the administration table, which would have, it would be a primary key over there. And then, um, you know, there could be a lot of keys going a lot of different ways, a lot of different arrows basically between tables. Okay, hopefully that helps. Like I said, at the end of the day, knowing which is primary, which is foreign, it's not as important as knowing what is the name of the column you're trying to connect to each other. So um, let's scroll up so here. Is, yes. In, in relation to that question, is it useful to think about one of your tables as a baseline table, keep things organized? Like you're joining stuff to it that. It can table. be, but that could change. So depending on your question, that could change. Um, we'll see as we go through, you're always putting one table in first kind of when you're doing this, and then you have a table that comes in second. And so maybe the first one is the one you're most, um, you want the most information from, but at the end of the day, they're going to join and you can like, you could say join this to that side, or you can say join it to this side. And so um, as we go through that, you'll kind of see the logic of it, but Generally, if you're trying to manipulate something before you do a join, it's easiest to have that one be like the left side. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, that's a perfect transition into what we're going to talk about next. So let me bring up another graphic. This this class is very graphic heavy, everyone. So I'll be like moving things around a lot. Um, so what we're one of the main things we're going to talk about today are mutating joins. So what this means is we have different types of joins. Um, in this case, each circle is a Venn diagram of one table and another table. And the question is, if we have the people table and we have the batting table, how do we want those to talk to each other? So we, you remember we'll have, we have the people ID on both the batting and both the people table. And let's say there's there's a people ID that's in the batting table that's not in the people table. And obviously we're gonna go through this all like with actual code to look through it, but I think it's really good to look at this first. So let's say the left side is the people table and the right side is the batting table for all of these. And I'm not sure if you can see the coloring too well. This is not a very darkly colored plot. Um, so let me just do stars. So like all the stars are the people table and then all the hearts are the batting table. So if I want the tables to join together and only keep the ones that have player IDs that are on both the people and the batting, I would end up with an inner join. So only this inside part of the Venn diagram is covered. So I would basically drop all the observations that are in people, but that are not in batting. So maybe it's a player that never 
did any batting. I don't know if that's possible in baseball, but maybe. Or, and a player who is in the batting table, but for some reason we don't have people information on them. Maybe we never collected the data yet. That would give us an inner join where we only want the inside of where the people ID matches on both. But where it starts getting a little bit more difficult is let's say we start with our people table and we have the people ID. We want to keep all of those rows, but then we want to bring in the batting rows. Um, so we can bring in the batting rows, but if the batting rows have something missing, we just drop those. We only want to keep the ones. I don't know how well I'm explaining this. This is, it's one of the R concepts that's kind of like, you either get it right away or it takes a really long time to grasp it. And it, so it's hard to explain. Um, there's also, if you have missing observations on um, both sides, it doesn't matter. Just replace those with NAs and keep all of the rows. So let me stop talking and let me actually go into code so we can see this better. <laughs> Oh, I don't want to draw. Stop drawing. Uh, mouse. There we go. So let's actually look at doing some joins. So we're going to, I'm going to write the order in which we're going to look at them. So we'll do inner join, then we'll do left join, then we'll do right join, and then we'll do full and before I do those, I'm, we're going to work with the batting data, but we're also going to work with just like a dummy, dummy meaning um, play to data frames so that we can um, see it like really obviously what we're doing. Um, so I'm going to just paste these and then I'll let you guys catch up. So Basically, this is a triple. We've worked with these before. We have a key and a value of x, and then we've got one, two, three. But then on our y, we have one, two, four. So you can see those don't perfectly match in terms of player IDs or keys in this case. Um, and then we've got y values of one, two, four, x, one, two, three. So if I run this and then I want to look at x, I can just call it up here. And you can see we've got one, two, three, x, one, x, two, x, three. And then for y, it's pretty similar, but instead we have one, two, four, and y1, y2, y4. So we're going to work with this and the um, baseball data frame as we're messing around with these data frames and testing how we can add them together. Um, in the chat, I'm going to paste the x and y data frames just so you don't have to type them out yourself. And we'll get started on doing an inner join. So I'll draw this and then we'll go, or I'll draw it, I'll code this and then we'll go back and look at some visualizations to see what's happening. And then we'll go back to the code. Um, I think that's the best way to do this. So we always start with one data frame. So let's start with X. We do our pipe and then you won't be surprised to know the code is inner underscore join. And here, we then say what we want as our second data frame. So Y is the name of the second data frame. And it's always good to be explicit on what key we're trying to join. So we do a comma and then we say by, and this is the argument of what is the key you want to join with. And in our case, the key is called key. So I'll say join from X, join Y by key. So let's look at what that looks like. So you can see down here in the console, all of a sudden now we only have two rows. So we've got key one and key two. Now let's look at this visually, what's actually happening in the background. So we've got our X data frame and we've got our Y data frame. What the inner join is doing is it's saying, if something doesn't match, drop it. We don't care about NAs, we just don't wanna look at it. We wanna only match the ones together that have observations in both X and Y data frame. So you can see three and four both get dropped. All right, okay, I'm seeing some head shaking, I'm seeing some grumpy faces too, but that's okay. That probably means you're thinking. So that's an inner join where we're keeping 
observations that occur in both X and Y. Um, oh, here, there's one more visualization. Some people don't like the GIF. They like this instead, where we've got the X data frame and the Y data frame. And because they match, you're going to end up with um, dropping three and four. I've got both of these visualizations on the Joyans sheet or on the Joyans lesson, so you're able to look back at them. Okay, so now if I wanted to, let's see, if I wanted to only look at the batting stats for players who were born in the 1980s, so let's bring that in. I would have to use two different tables to accomplish that task because, as I mentioned earlier, I don't have birth year information in the batting table. And so I need to bring in the people information to the birth year information. So to do that, um, because I actually want to filter the people data frame, I'm going to start with the people data frame. So I'll start with people and then I'll do a filter. Um, and I'm going to do a between filter. I don't think I taught you this, but it's quick to grasp. So we say between, and then what do we want between? We want birth year. And then we say the left side and the right side of that between. So 1980 and 1989. So this would give us any person whose birth year was between 1980 and 1989. So let's just run that to see. And we have 2,200 rows, whereas originally we had almost 20,000. So we've got 1980 birth years. We'll call those the 80 kids. Um, and then let's actually look to at the batting table. So I want to know how many rows are in the batting data frame. So here we've got 107,000 rows. Here we have about 2,000. And we want to bring those data frames together. So I'm going to copy and paste this just so you can see it step by step. But normally I would have just strung them together. So of my 2,000 people, now I want to bring in their batting stats. So if the player has batting stats, but he's not born, he or she is not born between 1980 and 1989, I don't want their information. But also, if a player, no, that's the same exact thing. <laughs> so if we have batting information that is not in the people table, meaning the player ID isn't there, we don't want that. And the same goes for the other way. If we have the people information on the left side, but we don't have batting stats, we also don't want it. So here, now we can do an inner join, where we want to join the batting stats to the people table. And again, we only want it where the people ID exists on both sides. So we'll do an inner join with batting by player ID. I just want to show you real quick that right now we have 26 columns and 2,207 rows. All we're doing here now is adding on new columns and also removing rows if they don't exist on the other side. However, so now we have 47 rows or 47 columns. So that grew from 26 to 47. But you'll see now we have 12,000 rows. We started with 2,000. What do you all think happened there? So we went from 2,200 rows to 12,516 rows. Why? Isn't this table... Oh, go ahead. This table has all the years they've played in, right? So then... Exactly. Because... So even if we started with where player ID was unique, now ours duh, is duplicated a bunch of times for um, you know, his birth year didn't change. This all stays the same. But if we actually look into the other columns, the, where would it be? Death date, birth date, year ID. Okay, year ID, stint, team ID, that all is gonna be unique. Good job, everyone. Um, so that can be confusing because you're like, well, I had 2000, now I have 12,000, what happened? Well, your rows got duplicated because you have multiple matches on your keys and that's okay. It's exactly what we wanted. 
Okay, so now we're gonna work on a left join. So let's look back at our visualization. So our left join, if we start with X, it will keep all observation of X, no matter what, whether or not they occur in Y. And then it will drop anything on Y that doesn't match to X. So let's look at another visualization here, uh, right here. So a left join, it will keep one, two, and three, the keys of X. And then on Y, it'll keep one, two. It won't bring in four because we, we're dropping those that don't occur on the right side. And then it'll include an NA for the Y column because it doesn't have information on key number three. So it'll look like this. All right, so let's work on coding a left join. It's almost the exact same syntax as before, which is why this can be so confusing um, and why it's really good to look back at these charts constantly as you're learning them. So I have my X and then I'm gonna add in the, um, the Y data frame using a left join. So I'll left join Y and then the same thing, we're gonna join it by key. Let's run that. So you can see now we've got the same as that was in the picture. We've got X1, X2, X3, and we've got Y1, Y2. Y4 gets dropped because we're using a left join and we get an NA. I personally use left joins the most out of everything. Um, and that's because I'm often working with a data frame. I do a lot of like data building where I'll take data from let's say 20 different sources on US counties. So if I'm taking 20 different sources on US counties, I have a data, data that I'm starting with, and maybe one data set has information on Puerto Rico, but I'm not looking at Puerto Rico. And so I don't want that Puerto Rico information, um, but I don't wanna drop any rows that I've already built either. And so I'll often use a left join to keep my rows how they are, don't mess with my original data, and then bring in whatever does match. So this one I would say is quite common. Um, now let's, look before we move on at a visualization of it. Oh, it always adjusts. So we've got our one, two, three, we've got our one, two, four. And because the one, two, three are the only ones that match, we drop four and get an NA here. It's implicit in the diagram, but I think you can see it. Again, if this is new to you, um, which I think it is for most people, you're just going to have to look at the diagrams constantly, work through the um, process a lot of times, double check your work a lot to make sure you're getting what you actually want. I think Mal has a question. No? OK. <laughs> Mal just unmuted, so I thought he had a question. Okay. Um, sorry, Kelsey, I yes. actually have a question. Please. So is the main difference between the inner join and the left join the fact that it will keep something and just put in A if it's not matched up? Yes. The left join so the the inner join is only going to pick the things that match on both sides. Technically, a left join is called an outer join because it's including um, in that original Venn diagram. Let me pull that up. Well, let me get my pencil out. So, oh no, won't let me scroll. Hold on. There we go. So this is an uh, there we go. This is an inner join, and these are all outer joins because they include something from the outer sides. So any of the left join, full join, or right join are gonna, they're going to take into consideration what is needing to be dropped more carefully. So inner join is just gonna drop everything that doesn't match. The left join and right join is saying, which side do you wanna drop that doesn't match? In the left case, it's gonna keep your original data frame, the left-hand side, the one you're already working with. On the right join, it's gonna drop everything from your original data frame and pay more attention to the right-hand side. Okay. Um, and you'll actually, I believe one of your labs has a right join and you have to think through the logic of it. Like, what am I trying to keep here? And then the full join just keeps everything no matter what matches and what doesn't. Okay, thank you. Of course. 
Okay. So now we need to do a right join. And it's, as you can imagine, almost the same as the left join. But um, it's going to go the opposite direction. So if I do x right join y by equals key. Yeah, today I'm realizing is less of a code class, more of a concept class, because all the code looks almost the same, but they're they're there are nuances to the differences. So now we said, keep everything in Y, keep everything on the right-hand side, but drop things on the left-hand side that don't match the right-hand side. So let me now confuse you all. If I do the same thing now with Y, let's do Y and X, and then do a left join, these will be equivalent. So let me just run both of those to show you that they're equivalent. Uh, I, there. So these are equivalent because if we have X and Y on one side and then Y and X on the other side, if we're saying focus on the right side or the left side, we're focusing on Y. In each. So here, the right join makes us focus on Y. Here, the left join makes us focus on Y. So you have to think about What's the first one you're joining? What's the second one? Because the first one's always the left, the second one's always the right. And then you'll be able to see, you know, those are equivalent. So if these are equivalent, well, technically the columns are in different orders, but the data itself is equivalent. Um, you can, like I said, if you need to manipulate your data before you do a join, like let's say when we we're filtering earlier, if you need to manipulate your data, that's generally going to be what's on the left side. But sometimes the right side is what you find most important. So you have to think through what's left, what's right, what's most important to you, what's least important. Just do a full join if you want everything. Um, these are all really important questions. So speaking of a full join, let's go ahead and code that and then look at its visual. So I can start with X and do a full join to Y by and so now this is the one where you don't lose any information but this can also make you duplicate your rows like crazy depending on um, the circumstance so in this case we've added an na for key three we've added an na for key four let me show you the visualization for that one so we start with the left side and the right side and then we end up adding rows for those missing datas. data. OK, I got a direct message, a private one. Um, no, OK. So here, let me pull that up. So in this case, the person's question is, are we setting the X as the left or the right here? And we're setting the X as the left because, and this is probably a circumstance of because a lot of this was created in English, I think, or in um, at least romance languages that go from left to right. English isn't romance, but ignore me. I'm not a linguistics professor. Um, the first one is the left side and the second one is the right side. So let me draw on here so you could see that. Let me do two circles. So in this case, this would be X. Oh, I don't like that background. And then this would be Y. And that's because the order you typed it in. So you typed X first, so that becomes the first one. And then you typed Y second, so that becomes the second one. If you flip it like here, then this becomes the left, this becomes the right. So you have to pay attention to the ordering. Hopefully that answers your question, person in chat who private messaged. All right. Um, okay, we did the full join, we looked at the full join. Now, what if I wanna take my batting frame and I wanna add in the team name to the batting frame? So I want everything from the batting frame and I wanna add in the team name. So. If we look at the teams table, 
there is a column that is the name. Let's see if we can find it without looking at my notes. Hmm. Let's do names, teams. I think it's just called name. Yeah, okay. It's towards the end though. So it's called name. We really want to add that to the other table because this BS1, CH1, that's kind of nonsense. And we don't really care about that. We want to know what exactly are the columns that we want to add in. So in this case, we really care about the batting data frame. And we don't care as much about the team's data frame. We only want to add in ones that match. It's likely that they all match, but I want to be explicit about it. So let's say add in the team names, the batting data frame. So to do that, I would start with my batting data frame because that's the one I care most about and I don't need to manipulate it. And then I want to do a left join. I'm gonna switch up what I'm doing actually. Because I just said, I only care about the team's name here or the, the names column of that team ID. I only care about the team ID and the name here we have other things that match to the batting ID, like the year, the franchise, et cetera. I'm sorry, the league, not the franchise. I'm actually gonna flip this around. I'm gonna first do with the team's data frame. And I wanna select just the team ID and the name. So let's see what that looks like first. Yep, we have the Boston Red Stockings, Chicago White Stockings. We got 2,904. I, because there's year ID here, there also might be duplicates here. So I'm just going to say distinct because I'm sure some of these are not uniquely identified, but I really only need them once. Yeah, there we go. So now we only have 183. So there's a lot of duplicates and I don't care about those. This is the data frame I want to join in now to the right hand side, which would be the batting data frame. So remember, we want to add the team name to the batting data frame. That's all we wanted to add. So I can say, let's do a right join because I care actually most about the batting data frame, but I wanted to manipulate the left side first. So let's join in batting and let's join it by team ID. Let's see how that works. Okay, so now you can see because it was the left side, those become my first columns. And then the rest of it gets joined in by player ID, year ID, et cetera. I have the same number of rows, 202,000. Mm, or not, hold on, let me think through this. My batting frame has 107,000. Why? trying to think of why that would get duplicated in some way. Huh. It's not double, that's the weird part. And these are all unique. Okay, well, for some reason could, it's getting could duplicated. Could players have played on different teams? Wouldn't that? I think that might be it, but batting, the team ID is unique. So in the batting data frame, all of the team IDs there's only one per row. And so the row number shouldn't change. Maybe the team ID has more than one name in some instances. That would be weird. Let's see, let's take this and then let's count um, the team ID to see if there's anyone who has more than one, um, who has more than one team name for team ID. Maybe they change their name over time do minus n. Okay, so for instance, BSN has six different names that it goes by. So this is a really bad exercise because it should probably be matching by year as well. So let's go ahead and see what that would look like. That's further along in the lesson how to match on multiple things, but it will fix our issue. So this was an unplanned, fruitful endeavor. So if I want to match on more than one key, there's no surprise that I need to make a vector. <laughs> um, that's kind of the, the special sauce that we always run into in this class is, well, why isn't this working? Because it needs to be a vector. So I want to match on team ID, but I also want to match on year ID, which I think is spelled year ID. And right now it's not going to work because that's not currently in my data frame. So let me add it on year ID. 
Um, and let's see if I end up with 107,000 rows. Okay, I did. Okay, so the issue was that teams go by more than one name, specifically BSN, which we could look up what that is. Um, I could show you another way to do that just while we're here. I could say instead of count, I can say add count. Is it add count? I think so. There we go. So the Boston Red Caps, Boston Beatineers, Boston Doves, Boston Bees. I've never even heard of these people, but okay. Um, they must be a minor league. So add count is one you haven't learned yet, but instead of saying count, add count doesn't collapse it, it just expands it. And so it's kind of like a mutate. But now we can see that's um, those are the different names that those go by. So that is where we had issues before, but this fixed it. Okay, back to the lesson. Let's now, let me make this bigger so you all can see it if you wanted to catch up. Let's list the first name, last name, and team name for every player who played in 2018. So we have to think through a few different things, but we need to know whether they played in 2018, which they have on the teams table, I believe. And we need their first name and last name, which would be the people table. So we know for sure we're gonna need the teams table and the people table. And those both should be capitalized. The teams table, however, doesn't have any player ID information on it. So I think I actually need one of those other three tables to kind of act as a mediator. So I'll use batting just because that's the one we've been working with so far. And from the batting table, I need, let's, let's, let's go through this. So from the batting table, we need the year ID, we need the people ID, and we need the team ID as well, because we want this from the people table, this from the teams table, and then we need a filter on year. So let's first filter. So we have less rows and we can think through the left hand side, right hand side issue. So we'll filter year ID equals 2018. That should work. Let's just make sure people ID doesn't exist. Nope. It's because it's player ID. That makes sense. This is why we test things. I run, I run my code a lot intermediately while I'm coding. That's always good practice. So we've got the year ID, the player ID, and the team ID. So these are all players who have played in 2018 now. So let's now bring in the team name. So we're working on the left-hand side right now, and we already have it filtered. So we for sure want to bring in the left-hand side only. Um, I think this would be the best as a left join because we have our left-hand side already filtered. We only want 2018, and we don't want to bring in team names that don't exist in 2018. So we'll bring in teams by, and I'm going to, because we have that year ID issue, I'm going to do both. I'm going to do year ID and team ID. Okay, and then closing parentheses. And let's see what that looks like. We've got year ID, player ID, team ID. Let's see if the row number is the same. So 1535. Five. Yep, 1535. Five. Good. So then we also wanted to select the first name and last name from the people table. So let's also do a left join there from the people table. And then here we just need to use um, the player ID. And now because the question says list the first name, last name, and team name, I'll do a select. So let's do, I think it's first name. It's kind of funky. Yeah. No, even worse. Name first, name last, and then name is the team name. It's real, real clean. Okay, so in 2018, we have 
Jose Abreu, who played for the Chicago White Sox, and then it goes on and on for 1,500. We might have duplicates in here. Let's see, distinct. No, oh, it looks like those are all uniquely identified. So this is the list basically of all baseball players in 2018. So I have a question real quick. Yes. Why, why would you want to do a left join and not an, like an inner join? So you're right. It depends on your purpose. So in this case, um, an inner join would have worked because I probably, if there was a team, well, if there was a team ID in batting that didn't exist in the team data frame, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't want to keep it either. Um, that would be weird in this kind of case for the batting that there was a team ID, but that's totally possible. And inner join would have done the exact same thing in this case. So let's switch it to inner join and see. So we had 1,533 rows. Now we have 1,533 rows. Yeah, it ended up being the same. And that's because there's nothing in the batting data frame that isn't matched in the team's data frame. That would be really bad database management if that was true. Um, so yeah, a left join or a inner join would have worked. So sometimes we have to think through having multiple keys. You all saw this already where we had player ID was matched in multiple rows of the batting data frame. And so multiple player ID got replicated from the people data frame that all of those rows got multiplied. That can happen on both sides of the data frame. There's a little bit on this in the lesson. I don't feel like going into it because I think it's, it's not obvious, but it's intuitive. If there's going to be a match, if there's multiple matches on both sides, it's going to kind of exponentially grow your data frame. So you have to be careful with that. Um, I'll show you a picture of what that looks like and then be done with that section. Um, so for instance, we've got one, two, two, three, and then one, two, two, three on Y. All of those twos match each other, but we've got two different X, two, X, three values and Y, two, Y, three values. So then it's going to grow exponentially on the um, joy inside where we've got X, two, Y, two, X, two, Y, three, X, three, Y, two, et cetera. Um, it can get complicated, so you have to be careful. You can get end up with really big data frames otherwise. Okay, now we're going to move on to something called a semi-join. You're going to get tired of saying join by the end of this class, and then we'll do an anti-join. So both of these types of joins, um, Sydney, did you have a question? You look like you had a question. Okay, cool. <laughs> Both of these joins are called, um, they're called filtering joins, right? Yeah, filtering joins. And this is because you're using the join to filter your rows and you're not actually adding anything new. Um, let me see if I can explain that any better without showing you a visual first. So a semi-join would join two tables together, but it wouldn't actually add the columns from the other table. It would only be looking at what rows exist in the other table and basically filter this other table based on it. Um, so for instance, a semi-join here, if we joined X to Y, we would see that in Y, we have one, two, four. The only ones that match are these inner joins and so we only keep the left-hand side, but we don't actually add in new columns. That's why it's called filtering because you're using it to filter. You're not using it to, the other ones are called a mutating join. So those are like mutating, like adding new columns. In reality, I've never used this because I would just use a filter, but there are reasons why you would want to use this. So um, let's look at what it would look like. So if I do X, semi join y by equals key. Um, you can see this is exact same. Let's look at the difference as a inner join. However, the only difference is it doesn't add the new columns from the y data frame. So can you all see that? We've got the x data frame and it 
filters in the same way, it keeps the same rows, but it doesn't add the new columns. Okay. The anti-join, on the other hand, is kind of the opposite. So I'm going to comment these two out just so you know, like that was comparison. Anti-join says what's in X, but not in Y. I'm going to write that because that's how I have to read it every time I look at it. So what's in X, but not in Y. So anti-join Y by key. So here, if we look at X, X had one, two, three, and Y had one, two, four. It's going to give us a, a row of the one that's in X, but not in Y. So let me pull up the visual so we can see this one. Nope, right there. So basically, they're joined together. We also don't have any new columns here either. So it's a filter but we're joining them together and removing rows based on what matched Y. So it's the opposite of a semi-join basically because we're checking what's there on both sides and we're picking to go with the one that doesn't match. This is the only one so far that we've seen that really focuses on not matches. And this is really useful um, if you're wanting to basically like build a Dictionary, I've seen this used a lot in text analysis where you build a data frame of words you don't want, which could be called stop words, like the and just words that are really common and not of interest to you. So you build a data frame of that and then you use an anti join against your um, corpus, is what you would call it, um, of words that exist in your book and you remove the words that are in your stop words data frame. If that made no sense, that's okay. But I'm just trying to give an example of why you would wanna use an anti-join. It's really to remove rows rather than to add columns or keep rows. So Let me give an example of where you would use a semi-join and then I'll give an example of how I would just use a filter instead because that's just people's brains work in different ways and that's just how I use it. So the question is to find the 10 players with the highest number of strikeouts from the batting table and create a data frame and then join that to select all players from those 10 days. No, that's terribly right. Terribly written. Hold on. What did I actually want? Years, I think. We're looking at the 10 worst players. I'm looking at my original code, meanwhile. The players with the 10 most strikeouts, and we want to select all players from people for those. 10 players. Okay, there we go. That's a little more clear and I'll have to remind myself to go update the lesson. So first thing we want to do is select the 10 worst strikeouts. We all know how to do this, so I'll go through this quickly. We're going to start with batting and we want to find the highest number of strikeouts per players. So to do that, we'll use a group by player because we remember there's more than one row per player. And then we want to know the number of strikeouts per player. So I'll do a sum of strikeouts, which is SO. I'll do an NA remove just in case. And let's run that to make sure it works so far. Okay, so now we've got the player ID and the number of strikeouts per player. And then there's a few different ways we could get the 10 worst. The quickest I've shown is slice max. So I'll slice max count strikeout. So that's the column I want to slice. And I want 10 of them. So it'll give me a little data frame of 10 players and their number of strikeouts. So if I name this, I'll say 10 worst. I can then take the people data frame 
and do a semi join because I don't actually care about the number of strikeouts here. I don't want to actually join that column in. I can do a semi join and just use it to basically select or filter the rows I want from the people column. So I'll do a semi join of the 10 worst by equals player ID. And that's because I didn't run it. So now we get a basically a filtered people data frame where we only have these 10 and then we have everything from the people data frame that was originally from the batting data frame. Um, I personally would do something like this, so I'll just copy it. Um, and I think it's useful to look at multiple ways of thinking through things. That's why I'm showing you. So um, I would just filter. So from this 10 worst, um, this is currently a data frame, as you can see, but I wouldn't want a data frame. I would want a vector. So I would do pull player ID and I'll show you what pull does. So if I say pull player ID, it'll transform this into a basically a list of the player ID names that I want to pull. So I would say 10 worst vector or something. And then I would say people filter player ID in and worst back. Something like that is what I would do. So I would first have the 10 worst and then I would use just filtering. Again, you can do it either way. They're literally doing the exact same thing. That's just the way that my brain would do it. And you're welcome to do any of them as long as you achieve the tasks and the homeworks, et cetera. Um, unless I'm explicit and say use this MIJ. Um, one thing I want to show before we move on, and I know we have like 10 minutes left, is sometimes your keys are named different things in different tables. So I just want to really quickly show when your key names don't match, um, how to accomplish that. And it's using a named list or a named vector like we worked with when we're working on a cross. So this is a, a, a great way to show this is the New York City flights data frame. Um, and where we have flights, but we want to join, surprise, there's more data in that um, package. We want to join in the airport's data frame. However, the airport's data frame has, if you remember the flight's data frame has origin and has destination, but the airport's frame just has something called FAA, standing for the federal airport code or something like that. And so they're different names. Um, you can go through this specifically on your own or during the lab, we actually will be working with this data frame or this data set. So you'll have to work with it. But so this is a little uh, preview for you. The first data frame we have is flights. So in the thing, the key I want to match in the first data frame, the left hand side is called origin. But on the right hand side, it's called FAA. So to make them match, I have to do this C equals like this. If you've done SQL, this is the same as, well, there's an equivalent to this in SQL, that's what I'll say. Um, so if I run that, you'll see, I have to load the data frame and it will work now. So the, where is it? The origin here gets matched from the data frame that contains the airport information, which has the latitude and longitude and altitude of these airports and the time zone, et cetera. You'll learn more about that in the lab. But this is a preview because sometimes your, your keys don't match the names, so you have to be careful. OK, we have 10 more minutes, and we're going to work through set operations and then hopefully how to append data as well. So I'm just going to paste some code here because well, I'm going to paste two new data frames we're working with here. 
because they're a little different and we, we need them. So we have a new XY um, and I'm gonna paste it in the chat. Um, so in this case, we have matching keys on one and two, and then the columns are now called the same thing. So I'll go ahead and run these both. So you can see X and you can see Y, and you'll see that the values are repeated. So we've got A and B, and those are repeated. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is really useful if you have data and you wanna check if it's changed or you wanna combine data that's very similar. So you're in this case, your data needs to have the same column names and we're really caring if the rows are the same. So we'll first look at how to do union. I'm gonna do a little bit more copying and pasting so we can get stuff done a little quicker. So union is where we would get all unique rows from X and Y. So I'm going to say union X, Y. And so this is gonna look at all unique rows from X, all unique rows from Y, and then stack them on top of each other. So we've got 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B. And there's a nice GIF of this on the website as well that you can look at. Um, this one's less um, commonly used. Another one we could do is oh, intersect, which is where we want the rows that are unique in each data frame, and then which ones are the matching between them. So it's kind of like a combination of a, um, a semi-join and a distinct. Um, this one I have never used in my life because I some of these are very specific use cases, but they're still useful to know they exist. So we've got intersect X and Y. So in this case, we looked at X, which has 1A, 1B, and 2A, and then Y, which has 1A and 2B, and which ones match between the two data frames. The only ones that match, kind of like a semi-join, are 1A, and so we end up with just 1A. And now finally, the one that I actually use sometimes for very specific purposes is set diff. And so this is useful if you have a data frame and you have another data frame and you're not sure if they're equivalent and you wanna know what's different about them. And so if I say set diff x, y, it'll say, um, let me paste this. What is an X, but not in Y? So what's unique about X compared to Y? And that's 1B and 2A. But then I can do the same thing and look at what's in Y, but not in X, which is just flipping it around. So what's in Y, but not in X? And we'll get a different result because what you're looking at first is different. These are called set operations. It's mostly thinking about comparing data frames to each other. Very specific use cases but they could come in handy. Okay, and now the final thing we'll cover today is how to append data. So, so far what we've been looking at today is how to join data together, which is where you have different columns and different tables that you wanna join together. However, sometimes you have the same exact columns, you just have more rows and you wanna add more rows. This could be that you have a sensor that's giving you a reading every day and you wanna add it to the bottom of something that's already built of another data frame. Um, so let me paste some more data in and I'll paste it in the chat too. So here it is, mm, my chat always disappears. Okay, there it is in the chat. And then here I'll say appending. Um, this is just some dummy data I made based on some plant readings. And so we have plant ID here, ID here but if you did a, a left join or a right join, you'd be adding duplicate information and it wouldn't be tidy because you'd be adding a new measurement. So this is like measurement on March 3rd, measurement on March 4th, measurement on March 5th. You would be adding new columns, but in 
that would be not tidy because we want all variables to be one column. So we would actually want to append these instead. So let's let me show you how we would do that. So we would use something called bind rows. So let me run these so I have them in memory. And the basic way to do this would be March 3rd and then bind rows March 4th and then bind rows March 5th. So right now you can see it's kind of taken these sets of four and now we have 16 or 12, sorry. Um, so they've just been stacked on top of each other in the order that we said. But one major issue now is we lose all date information here. So we could do multiple things here. Before we did this, we could say March 03. We want to take the data frame March 03 and add a column that's called date. So I can say mutate. I know I'm going quick here, but I think we'll hopefully we're all following. I get out a column called date where I want it to be equal to March 03, 2021, however you want to name it. And then when I append them, you see now I get a new column called date, but I'd have to go through and do that for the other two data frames. Um, that's totally possible to do. Um, and you can see also that bind rows is smart. If the rows are in a different or the columns are in a different order, it's going to look for the correct column. And if the column doesn't exist, it's going to add NAs. So bind rows is super useful. Um, instead of doing it like this, what I can do, oh, here, I'll do it like this first. So we have a mutate and then I want to bind rows. I can do a sub query here. So I'm just going to show you what it looks like. So I could do a mutate within bind rows. Basically, I can even use pipes. Um, this is March 4th. And then we have to close the parentheses. So this is basically saying do this first to the March 4th data frame and then bind it. So I can do the same. Oh, no. I can do the same thing here, but then for March 5th. So now when we, I overwrote my original data frame, so let's fix that. Now when we run it, we get a proper date. It's being read as a character. We'll figure out how to fix that next week uh, when we work with dates and factors. Um, or strings, I don't remember. But this is a great way if you're trying to stack data on top of each other. Um, March 5th got cut off. Oh, weird. Let me repaste that. It must have been too long of a chat. OK. Um, so yeah. Bind rows is smart. Let me show you another example. This is going to be a lot of pasting. Um, but it's very useful in certain instances. I would normally type these out, but you guys get it. So I've got a few different tibbles, and when I bind the rows, you can see that the, the bind rows is really smart because it knows we've got X, we've got Y, X doesn't exist in B, Z doesn't exist in A, so we're just gonna add NAs, but it's gonna match what it can. Um, and so it's really useful. Um, perfect timing, because I just finished. I'll see you all on Thursday for our lab. It's already up. Um, your homework for the end of this week for Sunday is not up yet, but I hope to get it up today. Um, I will be grading your progress reports as soon as possible. There's only four of them, so that shouldn't take too long. And if you have any questions, um, let me know. You do have readings, like always. So we're on week nine. So let me pull up those readings. So go through R for Data Science Chapter 13. It's on joins. Joins are hard conceptually. So I really recommend you go through and read these 
um, from someone else's perspective, because that's how you're going to learn best is seeing more than one perspective. For instance, this one's all about the flights, the New York City Airport information. Um, this will be good practice because on the Thursday's lab, we'll also be using the airport information. So I do recommend that you go through this. All right. Stop the recording.